Hey, and welcome everybody to another video. So in my last video, I talked a little bit about the, uh, I was talking about the ball and beam machine. I talked a little bit about the PID controller and how the control loop works and stuff like that. It was a very cursory glance over it. And I specifically said in that video that I'm not going to go into the details about how a PID controller actually works and that kind of stuff, because it's an entire topic in its own right. And I said that I was probably going to do a small video, maybe explaining about how a PID works in some detail. So I decided to do that here and that's this video. So I've got a really simple example that I fired up um, on it, written on an Arduino. I have the code for it here. So what we're going to do is we're going to step through this code. Uh, we're going to talk about it. We're going to try and understand a little bit about how it works. I'm going to use an example. I'm going to uh, basically turn it on. I'm going to plot the outputs here. So you'll be able to see kind of in real time exactly how it works. And I'll try and explain a little bit about it. This is going to be, again, like a really cursory sort of overview of the whole thing, because this is an incredibly deep field. There's a lot of maths behind it in the real world. And you can, you know, get into it really, really deeply. We're just going to kind of go over it at the high level, hopefully enough for you guys to understand how it works and maybe be able to implement your own one. So yeah, let's jump in. Um, okay, so first of all, I think I should talk about exactly what it is we're going to be controlling because obviously a PID controller isn't much use if you don't have an actual thing to control. So for that, I have this really simple little circuit thrown together on a breadboard. Um, the lighting is not amazing. Hopefully you can see that. So it's an Arduino Nano <clears throat> here and we've got some resistors and some capacitors and there's a little LED there that's just for me to see an indication of what's going on. So you don't need to worry too much about the actual circuit that's there. That's not super important for this case. Again, I might do a video in the future about that circuit in particular because it is quite interesting and I can explain in a bit of detail what it's doing. But effectively, all you need to know is that it's sort of a, it's a filter basically. So what we're going to control is we have the analog output of the Arduino and we have the analog input of the Arduino that's going to read. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off the program. The program's going to say, hey, I want to set my output voltage to be a certain value. And the PID loop is going to run on the Arduino. It's going to start you know, increasing the output voltage. That output voltage is going to go onto the circuit. It's going to get read by the input side of it to read what that value is. And then their PID controller will work in a loop to get that voltage to be exactly the voltage we want it to be. Now, the reason for the filter is, it's a little bit uh, nuanced, but basically when you set the analog output voltage of on an Arduino, you're not just setting an actual, you know, uh, a normal DC level. What you're actually doing is you're performing pulse width modulation. So you've got like a square train of pulses where the sort of, RMS, the average kind of value is going to vary to some DC level depending on how wide the pulses are. So that's, yeah, sort of <laughs> what we're doing. But the thing is, when you try and read that in on the on the um, analog input side, on the read side of things, it actually won't be a nice smooth value because it is pulsing. Um, so the reason we have the filter is we put the pulses in and then it goes through the filter. And then on the far side of the filter, what goes back into the Arduino as the input is more or less a smooth DC voltage. I'll explain, I think I will do a video explaining exactly how that filtering process works. Um, that'll be for another time. So just trust me that that happens. Effectively, what I have is the analog output of my Arduino is going to an analog input of the Arduino and it's creating a feedback loop inside it. Inside the Arduino, there's a PID controller which is setting all the values so that we get the, val the voltage value out that we want. That's the scene of what we're trying to do. So with that said, let's have a look at the code and see if we can figure out how that works. Um, so the first of all, we have our setup code. Uh, I will come back to this. It's not hugely important. Um, yeah, there's some values in here again with the, the, these are some config values. I'll come back to them once I've described how we're actually gonna do what we're doing. Um, simple ones I can say straight off, yeah, we have some input and output pins. So we have our output is DD3, which is digital pin three, which is the PWM pin. And then our input pin is our analog pin zero. Could be any of them. You just need to be able to read the pin. So let's have a look then at our main loop, what we're doing. 
So we keep track of time as we're running through it because that's important for a PID loop needs to know how much time has passed uh, for every single loop that you've done. So at the start of this, first thing we do is we use the millis method, which returns, I think it returns the amount of milliseconds since the application started running. I believe it tops out at 50 days or something like that. So that'll just keep counting, incrementing. So that gives us a timestamp in milliseconds. Um, we have like a last time, which is initialized to zero at the, oh, what's not initialized? Uh, yeah, well, it will be initialized. Yeah, it is initialized to zero um, at the start. So effectively we say that as far as we're concerned, the application started running at zero and everything on from that is um, however much time has passed the first time this gets hit. Um, we get this DT value that we calculate, which is DT would be a similar, uh, it's kind of a common notation for a period of time, delta T, um, DT. So it's basically, this is the loop time. So it's how much time has passed since the last time you made a recording. So for the first time, it's, you know, contrived example, but you know, as you, every time you do this, you update the last value last time with the current value. So the difference between the two is your delta T or how much time has passed since the last loop you did. Um, in this case, we then divide it by 1000. So we get a value in seconds as opposed to a value in milliseconds, which is fine. Um, so then we look, yeah. So a big part of what the PID controller actually does, um, so you'll see, I'll throw a graphic up here of a diagram of how it works. But basically what we have is you have something you want to control. You have some feedback loop where it's taking a value from the output and pushing it back to the input. And you have some set point that's setting the desired position or the desired value for what you want that to be. The input into the system is always, or the input into the PID controller is always going to be, well, what's the actual value that I got from my output compared to what the desired value was. So we call that the error signal basically. So. In this case, it's very simple. We can read our actual value from the analog read command on the input pin. Um, this scaling is just because the output values are between zero and 255 for PWM and the analog read values are a value between zero and 1024, which maps to zero and five volts. So they both mean the same thing. It's just different scales. So this just lets me scale them back to be the same. I get my actual value and I compare that to my set point value. So the set point I configure up here and I'm setting it to 75. So in this case, what's that? That's about 75 is, what is it? Like 1.2 volts, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a very high voltage, pretty small. Um, and so we compare the actual value that we read to the set point value and we calculate the error. So the error signal it will be the input into the PID controller, as you can see from the diagram. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what we're operating on. So the entire goal of the PID controller is within this loop, its entire goal is to squash that error down as small as it can possibly be and get it. So with each successive run that it goes on, the idea is that that error gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it either completely disappears or it gets to a certain tolerance where you're happy with it. So you would work out your percentage error at the very end and you'd say, okay, if it's within 1%, I'm happy with that. And you know, that's generally how you would spec this sort of thing. So in our code, then we compute our error and then we use our error and we pass it into our PID uh, method here and it spits out the output value. So then the output value is what you need to try and is what you're supposed to set. It's so it's basically the drive signal for for the for what's going to change the output. In our case, that's this analog write, and it effectively is setting what the PWM pulse width should be to try and get the value back around to be what we want. Um, yeah, I'm just glossing over that for the moment. <laughs> um, I'll talk about that in a second. What the actual PID, how we compute the PID value. Um, then what else do we do here? Yeah, so then th that's actually pretty much it. Um, here I'm just printing out these values. So this is just so that on the plotter we can see um, some nice graphs. And then I have this delay down here, which is a delay of 300 milliseconds. Now 
the thing with this is um this isn't how you would do it in practice in practice you want your pid controller to run quite fast um so that it can respond quickly enough to changing circumstances um for this example i've deliberately delayed it so that you can see it more clearly on the screen so you can see the wave changing as we as the pid controller runs in practice this would be much faster it just so happens that the standard built-in usb uh, serial monitor it yeah it's it's not great for this sort of stuff in truth debugging stuff but anyway it's just for visualization purposes here um okay so with all that said let's talk about the actual values themselves or you know calculating what the pid how the pid controller actually calculates the output so let's go here Whew. okay we've got our error signal that comes in and the idea of pid hence this clue is in the name uh, it stands it's three letters that stand for three things so it's proportional integral and derivative now that I'll get into it. I'm just trying to trying to think through this on my feet. I'm doing this live. I'm trying to think through it in my feet a little bit about the best way to explain it. But effectively, we have some error signal. We want to take that error signal and we want to adjust our output values based on three different um, computations on that error signal. So the first is we want some proportional amount um, of change based on the error. We want an integral, an integral amount of change, and we want some sort of derivative change. So for the proportional case, that's the simplest one to describe. Basically, this is, if you can imagine, it's sort of just scaling the output value. So if the error signal is one, the output will be one times some value, and that's just a straight proportional shift. So if you had, if your error was just basically, oh, it's always off by one, it's always off by one. Well, that just means I just basically want to add a little bit to that each time just to shift it up the way. So what we do is we calculate our proportional term. In this case, we just say, well, the proportional term is just always equal to the error. And then we multiply that proportional term by this gain value here. Don't worry about why it's called a gain. This is a term that comes from signals processing and stuff like that and how it actually works if you look at all the maths. We call it a gain. It's basically just a constant value that we multiply it by, which you know shifts by how much this contributes to the overall output. So in our case, we have our proportional value. That's just equal to the error, and it's times something, kp. So in our example, the code that I have set up here, I have kp set to 0 0.8. Now, that works here, but you've no idea. It could be any value. This value could be 100. It could be 1,000 for your whatever system you're trying to control, depending on your units and all sorts of things. In this case, 0 0.8 happens to be the value that I've chosen. I'm also not going to get into the hard details about really good ways of tuning PID controllers. It's kind of a little bit of an art form, tuning PID controllers. There's loads of methods out there for doing it. You can read up how to do it but they very much change from different machines, different types of systems you're trying to control, all sorts of different stuff. So I won't get into them in huge values. I'll just say that there is kind of some skill involved in doing it as opposed to just knowing um, kind of a method. Um, okay, so that's our first term, a proportional term. It's sort of just a like a linear kind of offset term, simple as that. Next term we have is our integral term. So... <clears throat> this is integral in the mathematical sense of integration. So when you have integration, it's effectively what we do, what integration does is if you have some waveform or something like that, when you integrate it over time, you effectively get the area underneath the curve. The area that that curve bounds is what the integral is. So if you get the integral of the error signal, you're effectively adding all the errors together as you go to get some sort of value. So if you could imagine your error just kept increasing, so you kept getting further and further away from your target value, the sum of that error is going to balloon and get really, really big. So what this does effectively is it's trying to fight against that. It's trying to respond in a way that says, no, no, that needs to be much smaller. So the bigger it gets, the the bigger the error gets overall 
then the larger this term will get, which will help, which is going to, the idea is it'll help to push the error back down again. That's kind of the rough intuition about what it's doing. The way we calculate that is it's just a value that we add to constantly. And what we do is we add the error times the DT that we calculated. Um, again, from integration, this is sort of a, a rough approximation of a numerical integral. It basically is, if you know the width of time that's passed and you know the value at this point, you multiply them together and that gives you like a rectangle space. That rectangle is a rough approximation for the area under the curve at that point. There's loads of other different ways of doing this. You can make this better by adding in different types of numerical integration systems. This is the most basic one you could possibly do. Um, but yeah, this value, roughly speaking, if the error continues to increase over time, that integral value will continue to get bigger and contribute back into the PID controller more and more. And again, it has its own gain. So you can decide <clears throat> by how much you want that to actually influence the output value, which is what that gain does. So final term, our derivative term. So the derivative term, um, again, so from mathematics, if you take the derivative of something, you're basically looking at the, so if it's, if it's based around time, so if it's something with respect to time is what we'd say for a derivative, you're basically looking at how the rate of change of that value. So say the rate of change of distance over time is what we call velocity. And that's, you know, it's, it's how much the distance that you're measuring is changing over time. And that defines how fast that's changing, which is velocity. So in our case, when we look at the derivative of the error, it's basically the rate of change of the error over time. So effectively, if you could imagine that we have our signal and its value is changing, if it suddenly jerks in value so that, that um, the error signal now has shot up in value, that's going to have a really high um, rate of change. And in which case, then your derivative term is going to get quite big. And this is going to want to squash that value down again. Uh, so the derivative term is kind of a weird one in, in terms of, I said I wasn't going to get into about like, you know, the gains and stuff like that. But typically derivative gains, we would have them to be quite small because if you have something that oscillates very quickly, the rate of change of that is very fast and that can lead to massive like explosions in the value of the derivative term, which can lead to instability in the system overall. So usually we keep those values, typically they're kept quite small and often they're not used at all. So that's another thing to say. The general term of this is a PID controller, which is a proportional integral and derivative controller. But some systems will be perfectly stable with just a proportional term in which case it would just be a P controller or there's another term phase lead and phase lag, which are special cases of PID controllers. I actually can't remember which ones are which, but it doesn't matter. That's, you can look that up on your own if you want. <laughs> um, but yeah, so say if we were to just ignore derivative terms in this and we just use proportional and integral, we would have a PI controller, or you could just ignore integral terms and you could have a PD controller. Um, so yeah, that's that's a little bit extra detail, but yeah, it, it's all effectively the same thing. The same algorithm runs, you just basically turn one of these to zero, say, um, and then that would completely remove the influence that that term has on the overall output. So then to get the overall output at the end, then we just sum all those together and that gives us our output. Um, we also need to keep track of for the uh, derivative term, I should have said this, yeah, so we have the error and we have some previous error measurement, which was like the last error measurement that we had. So to figure out the rate of change of that, we take difference between them and divide by the time period and that gives us the rate of change, which effectively is the derivative, um, sort of numerically. So again, this is a really rough numerical approximation to the actual thing. You can use numerical methods to solve these better, but this is just a really basic example of it. So that is more or less it in terms of explaining how this works and explaining the coding behind it all. Um, the next thing I want to do is I want to turn it on and show you guys live on the screen what it looks like, uh, how it runs, maybe mess with some values and try and explain a little bit more uh, about what impacts they have. Um, I should also say that all this code will be 
on my GitHub. So I'll take this uh, file and stick it up on GitHub. You can have a look at it, download it, play with it, make changes to it. Um, just there for reference. I'll put a link in the description. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so let's turn it on and see what it does. <laughs> so I'll hit the reset button on my Arduino. I'll kick this guy off. And what we'll see is we started and it will start at a value of zero. We'll have a set point value up here of 75. And the goal is that this value, which is starts at zero, should finish at 75 and it should stay there as well. And that's the ultimately what we're trying to do with the control. We start at some value, we tell it, I want you to be at that value. And then it goes, calculates how it gets there. And then it settles there and stays there. That's the whole idea of PID controller. Um, yeah, so that's what it does. Let's kick that off and see what happens. So I'll restart the Arduino, click run on this. So this is moving now and it's, I have it padded so that, yeah, there's a, there we go. And there you have it. So that's how, that's literally the system response. You're looking at it in real time. So I'm just going to stop this to talk about it. So what we're looking at here, if you've know a little bit about systems, if you've ever studied that, or you might've seen a graph like this before. And this is a really common type of graph. It's what we call a second order system response. Don't have to worry about what that means. You can look it up if you want, but effectively this is a really, really common graph that you will see of a, a system operating uh, with a PID controller. So we started off at zero, uh, the PID controller kicked in immediately when we got to here and it said, well, hold on, the error here is quite large. So I need to adjust my output value to make that error smaller. So the PID controller started computing values and effectively it needed to have a large response because the error was large. So that large response kicked some values up, but the thing is it went way over the line. And then at that point it went, hold on, we've gone too far in the, in the opposite direction. Now we need to tune those values back down again. So it did that. And then it realized it had gone too much in the far, in the opposite direction. You get the picture. So it just kind of wiggles its way down to try and get to its target value. So in this case, it's not settling down fully. Um, this and this kind of system response, I deliberately tuned it this way so that you could see this sort of the way it overshoots and then comes back down and then oscillates out to what we would call a steady state. So it's stable, but it is a, there's a little oscillation in it. Now, if you were to look at the error for this, it's very, very small. So if I just keep hit run so that it keeps running, um, we'll see now this will zoom in and we'll see by how much that value changes. So here we go. This is basically the steady state now that it's running in. And you'll see that the error is quite small. So it's oscillating set point to 75. It's oscillating between 76 and 74. So it's plus or minus one, which uh, in this case is, we would say the steady state error is two, which is 74, uh, 76 minus 74. So in terms of the target value 75, an error of two, uh, as a percentage, uh, what is that? That's, uh, the, what is it? So uh, two divided by 75 times 100. So it's 2.6 to 2.7% error, which isn't too bad. That's that's pretty low. It's a, So for some applications in real life, that might be way too much. You may need way smaller error than that, but for other applications that might be just fine. So the fact that it isn't just a set flat value that's not that bad. It's it's oscillating a little bit and that's okay. For our case, I'm saying it's okay for this case, but yeah, that, that's basically what that looks like. So let's imagine now, so I talked a little bit about you know, that the, the values of our, our gains here are what decides kind of what that graph looks like really. So let's say for example here, I'm gonna take this, uh, the proportional gain, it was 0 0.8. I'm gonna turn this up to 1.2 um let's see what that does so upload the code and then this will reset itself to a flat line yeah excuse me and then this should kick back up and we'll see what happens so we get our big spike and we get our damping effect which is starting 
to take effect, but you see this now is oscillating way more. So this is, again, it's a stable response as in it doesn't shoot off to infinity. It's, it's, it's pretty stable, but it's quite a large oscillation. So the error here is pretty large. Uh, you see it's oscillating between about 65 and a little bit lower than uh, 85. So the error here, the percentage error here is gonna be quite large. And this might be an unacceptable amount of error to have in the steady state version. Um, so yeah, this just shows you how you tune. Basically, it's just a very simple example of how you can tune your system. So let's say if I was to drop this down to a little lower than it was, let's see what that does. Um, this should, it might undershoot it or it might just settle down a bit quicker. Let's have a look and see what happens. Yeah, so that actually settled down quite quickly. Um, so that's a little bit, so it's a little bit less overshoot than the 0 0.8 value and it settled down pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, that's gonna look more or less the same, probably plus or minus one in the air when we, uh, when we look at it. So, I think that's like pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. Like you could talk for hours about this. Like I, I studied this way back in college, you know, 10, 10 years ago. And we studied this in so much detail, endless amounts of labs and experiments and all sorts of different graphs and things you can look at and how changing one value can push the whole thing around and all sorts of other techniques around tuning this and everything. But I think I've just given you the basic overview of how this works like if you know about that much that I've described, you could probably be able to set up a system and get it, you know, being controlled with a PID controller. Um, yeah. Actually, one thing I did want to show, this is kind of interesting. So you can have a look at the error signal and we can plot that over time. So effectively what we be, what this will look like is this will show us what the error looks like on the signal. It looks basically the same as this except it'll be sort of like uh, in reverse. Um, so if I throw that on, yeah, upload that. Let me have a look at that. Oh, oh I have to run this. Ah, silly game. Now let's restart it. So the error starts quite high. So effectively the error starts at like you know, 75, and then we see it drops down quite quickly, and then in the same pattern, and then it'll oscillate around. And so this is the error signal that's the input for the whole thing. Uh, and so we saw that the error started high, the error was 75, while the output value was zero. Then it very quickly dropped way down, shot very far under, then shot a little bit over, and then settle down and now we're at this steady state value where it's the error is oscillating between minus one and one occasionally it's at zero and yeah that's it so excuse me again <laughs> um yeah so i don't think i have anything else to say about this i could go on for hours we could just sit here and i could play with values and <laughs> we could look at the outputs on the graphs but um that'll get tiresome uh, after a while what i would say for you guys is to have a look, uh, if you download this code and set it up and running, um, have a look and see what you can get out of it. And yeah, play with some values, like, you know, increase the gain values, decrease the gain values, see what that does to the graph and try and build a bit of an intuition around how does this work? If I push this value, what does that do? How does it look and all that sort of stuff? Because that can really help kind of get this into your head about how it actually works. Um, in a, in a practical hands-on sense, as opposed to just trying to understand all the maths behind it, which is quite abstract. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna leave it here. I hope everyone enjoyed that. I uh, hope people learned from it. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. I'll do my best to get back to you and answer as best I can. Um, and yeah, in terms of this circuit, what it is, uh, I'll throw a circuit diagram uh, somewhere linked with the code so you can build this yourself and just see what it is. Um, and also I'll probably do a video where I talk about um, how this circuit works and, you know, some simulations and stuff behind it, a little bit more theory. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching guys. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.